Okay. I Tamek Sistsuko, good day. It is the afternoon of Sunday, February 2nd, 2020, in the lunar cycle Kato, which is our fourth of seven winter moons. I'm out here at so called Alexander Wilderness Park. And I thought this afternoon I'd just take a little stroll through and talk about a topic somebody had asked me, just a personal question, a personal history type of a question. And it takes a little bit of responding. It's not, a, not an easy thing to answer. What I was asked was, what piqued your interest in wildlife? And then I think he followed up with something like, judging by your knowledge, I'd guess it's lifelong. And so I thought, well, <laughs> can I even answer this question? Is there, is there something that piqued my interest in wildlife? Maybe what I could do is talk about my history of experience with wildlife in general or with animals, <laughs> other plants, other species. Um, that would be the easiest thing for me because I can't say that there's any one thing that really, really um, got me fascinated with wildlife. I've been, it is, it has been a, while, a long, lifelong uh, interest but it's it's transformed in various ways you know it's shape-shifted how that interest was expressed through my life I think if I had to say what was the one thing that compelled me toward the kind of relationships that I have with wildlife today I would say it would be the the transfer of a beaver bundle in the Blackfoot spiritual system. When Mahoney and I were transferred the beaver bundle, uh, one of our first major assignments in learning from our elder involved us eventually spending countless hours <laughs> uh, outdoors paying attention to birds, in particular waterfowl, but lots of others as well and I've told that story before so I won't go into detail of it here but in any case um, and just the role of the person who's taking care of a beaver bundle is that of the kind of in-between um, the mediator between the humans and the other species so you know, our responsibility as yuch gimmicks, which is what you call people who take care of beaver bundles, it, it literally means those belong to the water. Um, one of the main responsibility of yuch gimmicks is to maintain and improve relations between ourselves and the other species because we have a treaty and that treaty is um, embodied by the bundle itself, but what we benefit from it is um, primarily knowledge, you know, some of the, our most important knowledge um, comes from the other species. And it still does today, even though in other cultures, like in the mainstream, that relationship is just viewed differently, you know, a, a, a rat in a laboratory is treated and viewed and perceived and understood really, really differently than a rat in out in nature um, being perceived by someone who's living in the landscape indigenously, you know. <laughs> so, and the knowledge that comes from that rat 
may at times be very similar between the two you know cultures but on, on the one hand um, you celebrate then that that relationship the, uh, the, and then then that you receive that knowledge from the rat by respecting it uh, on the other hand you know you just breed a uh, whatever rats you want to use and you use them and you know you don't uh, hopefully don't get too attached although I know that's not always the case because I've had experience breeding rats myself and maybe I'm going off on a tangent that's leading away from the the conversation because what, what you bred rats <laughs> yeah we'll get to that um, but yeah if I had to say what was the one thing that piqued my interest so to speak as the as the question had asked as I'm, I'm walking through here there's a lot of white-tailed deer around it I'm just lots of them moving through the forest and I'm attempting to move through myself without stirring them too much I don't know if you can see the ones above in there too I'm not using my camera at the moment that moves in close so wouldn't mind finding some antler sheds it's that time of year and I'm in that that uh, mode and work where I might make something interesting out of one um, but I'd like to find it too you know the, f the finding of something that you're going to use artistically I think is is part of the for me part of the uh, the finding, the gathering, and all of that kind of thing. Um, it's part of important part of the process. I wouldn't just go buy my stuff at the store. I should stop and use the other camera. Just record a bit of this. Deer eating. Um, I can even see from here eating the the buds off of the poplar cottonwood trees. Yeah, I'm going to shift to my other camera and if you want to see the footage from it, you'll have to go to my other video from today. <laughs> and we'll get back to the topic when I'm done here. Back again. As it turns out, at least this buck over here still has got his antlers on. I know some of them are starting to drop now, but Maybe not here, not yet. In any case, let's go back to the question. All right, so you know what piqued my interest, what like uh, really drove me to um, the kind of relationship I think that I have now with the animals primarily was that transference of the role to becoming an Iochkimi and how I could fulfill that role in my contemporary life but I'll talk more about that but let's rewind the clock way way back <laughs> let's go to Ryan's uh, childhood in fact very early childhood so early that I don't remember but my dad does he tells this story about how when I was just a toddler or what have you he was taking me out for a walk and he liked to um, take us and make us you know touch different things and see different things in nature uh, you know touch all the leaves and the branches and this and that the rocks and he came across this big green uh, grub of some sort some kind of tomato worm or something and he got focused you know drew my attention to it and then as I was looking at the worm fascinated uh, he squished it and smashed it and killed it and I was so mortified <laughs> uh, the look on my face and stuff he you know he I guess he instantly regretted it but um, yeah there's a bunch of deer in the thickets here as I walk through I'm just kind of taking my time so they can move around me um, That was something that he thought probably made a big impression on me. <laughs> Definitely made a big impression on him. 
Um, my earliest kind of wildlife memory goes along with, well, I might have even had earlier memories. I, I remember playing with snails in my grandma's backyard in Costa Mesa, California. Um, I remember feeding them to her dog. <laughs> Puppy was the dog's name, I think. Anyway, um, <laughs> my grandparents were very creative. My paternal grandparents in naming their dogs uh, and cats. <laughs> puppy uh, anyhow but probably like my earliest memory of being fascinated by something wildlife wise came when I was I think five years old and we had moved from California to Salem Oregon and my parents were basically setting up setting up for life in Salem away from their families <laughs> for various reasons and um, and it was a place where my dad could get work and stuff he was an electrician so we were living in these apartments there was a field beside the apartments and I remember a day when a friend and I were out in that field in tall grass that you know was above our heads when we sat down in it and right beside us as we were sitting in this tall grass a pair of male garter snakes came and wrestled you know came up uh, like the like the medical caduceus symbol came up and twined around one another and were wrestling and stuff in front of us um, that was very fascinating. May have had something to do with my early interest in snakes, um, but definitely was got me curious about what was going on with that and the wildlife around me and such. Um, we moved out of those apartments pretty quick. My parents had a house built, and that house um, was kind of at the north northeast edge or of uh, of town what's now Kaiser was then the northeast edge of Salem but uh, my, my parents had kind of uh, an acre or so behind their house and then and it, the, everybody did on that street so there's a big kind of uh, field back behind the houses and then we were one of the last streets before you got to the agricultural zones areas where um, that were interspersed with old growth forest and stuff like that so you'd have farm fields and forest and farm fields and forest and those those areas became like my playground growing up so from age 6 to 18 I was in Oregon and um, early on I was I I had a a curse set on me from the bees and wasps. Uh, I think I was maybe six years old. We moved into that house, and out in the back field there was an underground beehive of of bumblebees, and I was out there with a bunch of kids, and we thought. You know, let's wipe out these bees so they don't hurt anybody. So, me and my brilliant plans for doing that, I, I had I was in bare feet, and I plugged the hole with my bare foot, foot, and uh, yeah, of course I got swarmed. I don't really think I even got stung, but I got swarmed. My mom, like the kids, panicked, and my mom panicked. I don't know if I got stung or not. I would surprising if I didn't, but. Um, but I sure did from then on. Every year from then on, I received multiple stings from bees and wasps. And I think, you know, something inside of me, the little voice, the Jiminy Cricket, tells me they were, they were colluding in this, the bees and the wasps, all the different species of them, and that it had to do with me and my attempt 
to wipe out that hive that time. And the curse was only lifted much later in life. I was maybe 25, 26, 27 years old. I was married already with Mahoney. She had arthritis and we went through a ceremony trying to deal with her arthritis that a, a medicine woman put us through. And as part of that ceremony, I did a cleansing of our house. And the materials that I used for that cleanse, I, I went out uh, away from our house to, to discard in the ground. And it was, it was snowy, I think. And when I went to get, discard them on the ground, I, I, you know, shuffled a bit of area to, so I could see the ground. And as I exposed the ground, there on the ground was a, uh, probably hibernating, <laughs> but I perceived as dead wasp. And, uh, I put the offering, you know, what was, what I used for the cleanse there. And... I knew, again, the little voice that the that the that the bee um, curse was lifted, and after that, I wasn't afraid of bees. I could go where there were bees, wasps, um, go next to their nests, check them out. I knew they weren't going to sting me. I have been stung a few times since, but always I think on accident. They didn't, uh, you know, either I stepped on them or. I'm driving by with my elbow hanging out the window and we bump into each other, that kind of thing. Um, none of them have come after me in the ways that they used to. I mean, it was bad. And uh, I've talked about that in other videos, told the, the, the little sub stories to show how bad it was. But they were after me and they usually got me. <laughs> no matter where I lived. Or from Oregon, you know, I, I moved to a lot of places. We'll talk about that. But, all right. So early on, I had this thing with the bees happen. Um, I also got my first pet snake at age eight. It's a boa constrictor. I always thought that this came from me and my interest in snakes. Um, however, in recent years, I've, I've, I've acquired similar, you know, member of the same species, similar snakes. And some of my aunts or uncle had commented that my uncle, my late uncle George, who at that time would have been fairly recently passed away from a motorcycle accident when I was not even born. Um, George had had a snake like that, they said. So that got me thinking, huh, maybe, even though I always thought it was my own idea to, to pursue having snakes as pets. I bet my dad put that idea in my head too, you know? <laughs> um, any case, I had a boa constrictor from age eight, which made me a spectacle. Um, but it was also very interesting to learn about other species, learn about the snakes, learn how to take care of the snake. I ended up, this is how I ended up uh, raising rats. My dad, and I raised colonies of rats in the garage to, to feed the snake, Chachi, <laughs> named after the Happy Days character. And um, yeah, I raised that snake until I ended up leaving at 18 years old. I left for the, for the army. And uh, at that time, the snake was adopted by a policewoman and it was large. It went from, when I bought it, it, it was uh, just a newborn basically. Um, I was eight, and then by the time, ten years later, when I was 18, that snake, you know, draped over my shoulder, its head and, and tail, you know, were touching the ground, hey? So, it's a big snake. Um, along the way, though, I had lots of other little uh, wildlife, mostly reptile kind of pets and stuff. Um, I remember you know, very keenly having gone to visit my maternal grandparents in Arizona and coming back on the airplane, this of course, but way before um, Homeland Security, I came back on the airplane with pockets full of snakes and lizards, live ones, <laughs> from the Arizona desert, none of whom survived very well in Oregon. 
uh, for any length of time. Also, we also had a tank of garter snakes. They ended up having babies, which was kind of cool. Um, so I had snakes in my life from a from a fairly early age, you know, age eight. And then at age 12, I had what was probably one of the most foundational, you know, kind of ex, uh, gestalt experiences of my life, where I was out in those, you know, fields um, between the neighborhoods, Edward Scissorhands land type of neighborhoods, and the old growth forest. I was crossing through an onion field that was once an ancient lake bed, not long ago actually, a, a lake bed. And I came across an arrowhead. And it, it actually happened that that day I'd gone there looking to see if I could find an arrowhead on that field. Because I'd heard that if you walk farm fields, I'd read it actually, if you walk farm fields and you walk back and forth the rows and, and look, you find arrowheads. I'd never tried it before, so I tried it that day. and. I didn't even have to go back and forth once and I found an arrowhead. It blew my mind. <laughs> um, but it blew my mind in several ways. It blew my mind that I'd found such a thing. It also blew my mind that, like, I, I, uh, the, ge the geography of the area, of what, where I was and what I was doing, I could see all of a sudden a kind of colonization of the landscape. You know, I was on the farm field, which was the intermediary phase between the forest, you know, the real forest and the, and the Edward Scissorhands neighborhood. And, you know, the, the, that Edward Scissorhands land and that urban environment was just completely laying over top of and masking um, the reality that we had very recently as human beings lived here completely differently and we did so for thousands of years um, and in, in ways that were more sustainable right I could see this the colonization of the land and it blew my mind it blew up because I you know before then I kind of like in thinking and this is just from growing up in in North America, you know, as a white kid, um, you know, even though we were told we were black, but we grew up white, you know, so culturally, um, and you're growing up and you, th you don't think of, uh, that Native American stuff is recent, or even that there's, you know, still people, the people are still here, you know, um, and finding that arrowhead, realizing how recent, like this is just look brand new, you know. Somebody could have just laid it down yesterday. And uh, yeah, it's, it's mind blowing. For a 12 year old kid, it, it disturbed my sense of place so bad that I've, I think in some ways, I've been trying to relocate that sense of place to feel like I know where I am ever since. I'm, I'm you know. I, I kind of feel like that now, but I don't trust it anymore. <laughs> Any case, um, so that experience was such a gestalt thing in my mind that it became immediately addictive. I have to go out in those fields, I have to find more, I have to learn more. And I associated the nature, like all the plants and animals, you know, with that, with that um, history, the cultural history. You know, I wasn't just out there looking for more artifacts, but I was out there looking for knowledge of how to be a human being in that place, and how to see that place as it as a as it was meant to be, you know, as as it as it really is, not masked over by this cultural overlay of our of our modern urban environment. How do I really see that place? So I started spending hours and hours and hours. You know? If I had a couple hours after school, I might just be walking the fields if I wasn't hanging out with friends or something. I might just be walking the fields on a Saturday or Sunday for sure. I might spend eight hours walking around out there. And not only in the fields, but in the forests. And one of the things that happened 
out at that area where I was, um, for whatever reason, the farmer who owned that land, when he started knocking down the forest to, to make room for some wheat and such, he left this big, um, really grand, really beautiful, I mean, he probably left it because it was so, so uh, sublime, this, uh, um, west of this uh, Pacific Madroni tree. And the Madronis, it must be really closely related, related to the, um, those trees I was seeing in San Francisco, the eucalyptus, because it's the sim a similar way. It has kind of a very shiny, glistening red bark, but um, when it's mature, hey? And then it kind of has a puzzle bark as it, as it moves into that maturity. Anyway, this tree was huge. It reminded me of Swiss Family Robinson, you know? I was in awe of that tree, and there was always this hawk, this red-tailed hawk, perched in that tree when I would arrive. And that hawk would start screaming when he saw me arriving, and I thought the hawk was talking to me. Uh, now I know more about hawk language, and that hawk was signaling um, because he was agitated that I was coming into the area. But that time I thought, maybe the hawk is talking to me. Start, I, that's how I felt. And so I didn't grow up with any religion. Like we, we didn't go to church. Um, even though I you know, was familiar with the basic ideas of Christianity just because it's so prolific in the culture. Um, it was never part of my upbringing. My upbringing was pretty different, you know. It's a lot of homemade clothes, a lot of garden stuff. Uh, my dad didn't hunt, but he did take me around to slaughters. Um, he taught us a little bit of fishing, but he was never that kind of guy, hey, the hunter-fisher type. He was, he was more like, I want to go out and, and look at the landscape, learn about the rocks, hunt some fossils, maybe paint paint a picture <laughs> he was more that kind of guy um, but he took me to slaughter so I knew what it was to 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 kill something and to eat it and all that stuff and um, something big and it, that may have become part of why I undertook for myself kind of a rule early on in life um, definitely by my teenage years that the rule was if you if you kill it you have to eat it and I don't know if that's something that maybe my mom introduced because at one point I wanted to get into guns hey I was interested in guns and so I was demanding a BB gun at the very least pellet guns my mom was very wary because she knew I would kill things with it birds that she loves um, that, that you know talk about influences too my mom I guess was a, you're, you're kind of typical backyard birder she would she would always had bird feeders going and she loved to draw the birds in um, but she was very concerned that I would kill birds with a BB gun and and, and rightly so because <laughs> so I did end up killing uh, at least one robin I shot with the BB gun and because I killed it I cooked it there in the forest with my friends and I ate it um, <laughs> similar, similar thing happened with a garter snake. I ended up cook, I didn't kill it with a, with a BB gun. I can't remember how, I think I killed it because I wanted to try to skin the snake and get a snake skin. But because I killed it, I also ate it. Hey, anyway, um, I was out there, uh, you know, walk in the fields and stuff whenever I got a chance, and that bird would start, the, the, the hawk would start calling, and I never had any religious training, so I started expressing myself and my, my wants and stuff in a kind of prayer form to this hawk, and basically telling it, you know, I'm out here wanting to learn more and see more and find more and um, wherever you go to show me these things I'll follow and so the hawk you know I'd walk up toward the hawk and of course the hawk could eventually get agitated and fly away and wherever it flew toward 
I followed it. And no wonder the, the bird would start yelling as soon as I walked out on the field, you know? Because after a while he knew, oh, there's that kid that's going to follow me around for potentially the next eight hours. <laughs> that's what I would do. Um, and I would think the hawk is showing me to places and to plants and animals, whatever I found on that route. Uh, especially where hawks were perched, like where he would land and kind of wait for me to be catching up. I would go look around that perch and whatever's at that perch I was sure the hawk intended me to find. So I still have some some items um, that the hawk gave to me, so to speak, during that time, including uh, the, the paw of a mole, including um, some mysterious products out of some otter poop. <laughs> Ryan's magical charms. Um, I still have some things that the hawk gave me and feather. Well, I did have feather. Actually, I don't have that feather anymore. That feather from that very bird. Um, I ended up having a dream about that. Uh, a dream about that bird later on after I was married to Mahoney and the dream was interpreted by a Blackfoot elder uh, late Frank Weaselhead and he saw in it the Thunderbird um, and a, a need for me to give that feather transfer it to uh, our daughter Justine which I did so that that feather is still at the house uh, where it should be in the China cabinet where Mahoney and Justine are any case um, that was kind of the way it was for me growing up in terms of my relationship with wildlife. I guess one other big aspect of it would be when I was kind of getting into my later teen years, 16, 17, I started getting involved with the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, particularly their, their field station in Eastern Oregon, in Fossil, Oregon, um, where I ended up working the summer between my junior and senior year of high school. Um, where I was, you know, leading uh, real naturalists around, showing them, you know, different plants and area and animals, um, you know, in the area. And I, I learned a lot, uh, I think, from those naturalists about how to pay attention to nature. I mean, those that whole uh, couple of summers that I was involved with that, and especially the one working, you know, every every day at dinner, every evening at dinner we would just have a big round of like who saw what that day in nature and what did they make of it and all of this kind of stuff. So it was <laughs> uh, kind of a naturalist think tank for young people um, or, or an experience um, introducing young people to serious adult naturalists. Um, then I went in the military and I was in the military for about three years. While well, in the military, I, I was at, um, did my basic training in New Jersey, at Fort Dix. And then I was for about maybe a year or so, not quite a year, maybe 10 months. I was in San Angelo, Texas at Goodfellow Air Force Base for, for my signals intelligence training. And then Fort Polk, Louisiana for working live missions um, and that was it. So I moved around uh, Texas, Louisiana mostly um, except for the brief period in New Jersey where I was really you know being tortured and didn't have time to deal with wildlife stuff anyway. <laughs> but Texas and, and Louisiana I did and I did get into some you know, of course, there's gators down there, and there's a lot of uh, venomous snakes and such. Uh, probably my most usual encounters with, with the reptiles down there involve water moccasins, and uh, which I saw some interesting things down there. Eastern Texas, one time I saw kind of a snake race of sorts on a little stream in a little tiny little town. Um, and I have no idea what was going on, but there were water moccasins with half of their body out of the water. And uh, many of them, dozens of them, racing down the stream one way and then coming racing back the other way. Um, 
no idea what it was what was going on but something something of the snake culture um, during those times during those years in the military I did try keeping pets again uh, mostly lizards that I would catch <laughs> while in the field on field assignments and such or just in the forest around Fort Dix um, I would catch lizards and um, bring them back into my dorm, my barracks. Uh, I was hoping that they would eat the cockroaches because once I was in Louisiana, I started having to really deal with cockroaches. That would carry through after Louisiana to when I moved to Boston, went to school. I went to University of Massachusetts for four years and uh, I lived with a, a girl there in Boston and that's the first time I started kind of like other than taking in the lizards that I was catching in Boston I took in um, some some baby animals in particular I'm thinking of a squirrel that I took in but for a while I also had a ferret and stuff that I caught on the street but there was a gray squirrel that I took from a pinky and raised up to adulthood um, that I think eventually died from probably getting a hold of some cockroach poison, some insecticide coming from one of the other apartments. I, w I would never let uh, anybody spray for roaches and stuff in my apartment, but, but the walls are pretty thin. <laughs> um, but I really, you know, I wasn't doing a whole lot with wildlife all along, right? It's just doing my thing. And uh, I had had an identity crisis when, when in the military. I didn't want to be an American anymore. I wanted to explore uh, Blackfoot identity, you know, as an alternate identity to to just being a patriot of a of a nation. I realized I was I always grew up thinking I was Jedi material, and I was really just a stormtrooper, you know. <laughs> working for the empire, a pawn for the empire. So, any case, um, I ended up coming out here, ultimately, maybe starting maybe a year into my undergraduate training at Boston. Uh, the, you know, my first day of training there, I went up to an anthropology instructor. They didn't have NAS, Native American Studies, or anything like that there. I went to an anthropology professor and told him, I want to know about being Blackfoot, and you know he 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 guided me the rest of my time there at the at the university and beyond. But he told me pretty early on, man, you're in the wrong place to to find out the answer to that question. You gotta go to Montana, go to Alberta, go to the communities, what have you. So that's why I started doing. That's what led me out here was that identity crisis, and when I started getting into the Blackfoot world. Uh, I, you know, having never grown up with any religion or spiritual tradition or what have you, when I started hearing the Blackfoot stories and understanding things about, you know, the bundles and where they came from and, you know, how they, uh, they, they're really, uh, you know, the mediums between the human beings and the other species the treaties that we have bet between us and uh, and what we're gaining, the, like even just that perspective of, you know, we're learning from these other animals, so we have to respect them. Hey, we'd only kill them if we're going to eat them. That's a Blackfoot value, but I, I had that value in me already as a very young child, just naturally. Um, so it started, you know, the Blackfoot stuff was making sense right off the hop, you know. Uh, everything that I learned, you know, I, mean, I didn't have to believe in anything. I didn't have to have faith. The sun is right there. I can feel it right now. It's warm. That's why I don't, I'm not wearing my jacket. And that warmth, so the, you know, as the sun comes closer, it in, engenders life. But it can also take it away just as easily. Come a little closer than that, you know. Uh... I didn't have to extend any 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 mystical belief 
to really get into a lot of what the Blackfoot tradition has to offer. It's about relationships and our relationships with one another as humans and our relationships with the other species in nature. And it's a very respectful tradition that looks at the other, looks up at the other species as elders, you know. So all of that made a lot of sense to me. Connected with my own kind of stumbling, youthful experimentations in learning from the landscape and eventually um, led me into being transferred, as I say with Mahoney, um, as Iach gimmicks, as Keepers of the Beaver Bundle, which is really the very first bundle and largest in the Blackfoot tradition in, in the past, the hub. No new bundles are created or you know, validated without the beaver bundles in the past. New, new, new things come into the system through this, so it's the creative hub, and it was the first one that was targeted by the churches and stuff to, you know, we need to get rid of this because without getting rid of this, they're always going to be able to continue to grow their, their tradition, no matter what else we take out. But if we take out the beaver bundles, it's done. They're static, what they got left. Um... They, they gave it their best try, and it didn't work. Now the beaver bundles are back. They came back through repatriations, and I was a big part of that. I'm very proud of that, that era of my life. Um, but being transferred into the beaver bundle, and assuming that, that role, and coming from my own you know history, personal history of experience and stuff, and getting um, some of the assignments that we were first given, which included rekindling the tobacco tradition, which included rekindling the, the waterfowl eggs as food tradition, um, recruit, re, you know, getting the phenological calendar system down and learning to use the stick calendars. Again, these were all things that were defunct when Mahoney and I took the beaver bundle that are now back in play um, because of our work with it. And it just brought us every step of the way more into nature, more into nature. Of course, me being a snake enthusiast from early on, um, when I learned that I was living in Lethbridge, home of rattlesnakes, <laughs> I thought, I got to get into these snakes a little bit here. Um, so there was a guy, Reg Ernst, who started the program that I currently run, uh, who was, um, who had done some, some research studies with the snakes and such, pit tagging and this kind of thing, following them around, see where they go during the summer. And I gave Reg a call and said, hey, if there's ever an opportunity for me to volunteer on any research, projects with the rattlesnakes I would love to do that um, and he invited me up in the mountains for a wildflower walk he was he was given and this was gonna be you know our time to meet each other and this kind of thing and I ended up bailing not going to that I, I don't know what came up but something came up that was more important than me going to the mountains with Reg so I never did and then I didn't hear from him again for another couple of years I thought I'd just blown my whole opportunity, but a couple years passed, and then one day out of the blue, he gave me a, a phone call. I was at Red, Red Crow College at the time. He called me there, and he said, you know, he has to leave. Him and his wife have to move away fairly suddenly. It involved family and stuff up north, and he was looking for somebody to take over the rattlesnake program. Would, would I be interested? By that time, I had kind of established myself as a nature writer in Alberta. A lot of people were familiar with my writing, so maybe he knew me from there by that time, too. Um, nature Alberta magazine like was publishing my field notes that I was taking, doing my studies that were uh, really from the beaver bundle. <laughs> I started taking field notes of the, what we were learning down there at the, uh, you know, at Spopikimi every day visiting. And um, and I published those in a blog form along with really nice photos and stuff. And Nature Alberta Magazine 
got interested and I said, why don't you just call from my blog, take what you want, publish it so, as a column every every publication and and uh, easy for me, easy for you. So they started doing that. So people got to know me. Maybe Reg gained his confidence in me from that. I don't know. But he called me out of the blue and says, hey, uh, would you like to take over the program? And I said, sure. And so for the rest of that summer, uh, I kind of trained with him, he showed me what he does, um, told me about how he feels about everything out here and all of that. And um, But he gave, when he handed me the program, he handed me the program. And I took it in some of my own directions, including making it a much more public, vis publicly visible program. You know, with the YouTube and the Facebook and all of that stuff, this program is something much different than it was uh, in Reg's day in terms of its use as a public education piece. Um, but I, you know, in that work, I've come to, to really utilize what I've learned from the Beaver Bundle um, and in understanding why I'm doing the work to begin with <laughs> and, uh, and in how I might approach it. Same goes for the Beavers that I'm gonna get going on uh, here this summer. <laughs> The city is now kind of opening up. Hey, maybe you can do something so we don't always have to kill the beavers, just like the snakes. And so that's initially probably going to start off as totally voluntary effort, but maybe at some point will become actual program. So I'm kind of setting in that, you know, following in the footsteps of Reg in that respect, hey, taking on something, something new. But also I very much see it as appropriate for me because of my transfers and such. Um, who else? Who else is going to, at this point, be at the helm of starting a beaver mitigation program uh, that works here, you know? So I, was inv I got involved with the snake program. I took over the program. I was just doing the rattlesnakes. And then the city had a... Um, scourge of distemper go through a raccoon population and a lot of raccoons were showing up dead or dying at people's properties and so uh, the guys from the animal control didn't necessarily want to deal with them because it would you know contaminate all their equipment and their stuff that they use on cats and dogs. Um, I don't know why my nose is so drippy, I'm sorry. But, in any case, the push come to shove, they, they asked me if I would be willing to help pick up sick raccoons, and I was, and they equipped me at that point with a catch stick, catch pole, kennel, and a trap, live trap. And then from there, you know, working with the raccoons there for a little bit, I started thinking, hey, you know, uh, this working with these, uh, with these animals like raccoons and skunks might be another thing I can do, much like the rattlesnakes where people are gonna hire exterminators and such, um, people that are gonna gas these animals. I could step in, offer a lower price, take that business away and uh, uh, and not kill the animals, hey? Figure out better solutions. Right now my solution is take them down into the river bottom and release them. You know, that's not the best solution yet, but it's better than the death one right away. <laughs> Any case, that's kind of the whole story of it. Um, encapsulated it as quickly as I could tell it, which wasn't very quick at all. And there's still a lot more detail, of course, that I left out. Um, you know, all of my experimentations, I've done a lot of experimentations with, with, uh, plants as well. I've been fascinated with learning, you know, how to, um, uh, make use of the plants medicinally and food wise and otherwise technology wise, um, plants and animals. I'm, I'm very interested in being human still on this landscape because I know we're not and I was shown that at 12 years old <laughs> and 
this is where it's taken me so far. Um, oh, I should I should add just one little more element that's pretty important, which is how I got involved with birds. Mahoney and I, and there's a whole video on this too, so I won't go in depth on the story. Uh, you can you can look up Derek and our story with Derek, the history of Derek, but um, Derek the magpie. But any case, at one at one point, Mahoney and I had decided to try out an old practice we'd read about in some ethnographer's notes, where you a guy would take uh, acquire a hatchling bird, raise it up to um, adulthood. To fledge and let it back out in the world with the idea that the bird because you're bringing it through the most dangerous period of its life that bird would um, would return in return gift you with all kinds of knowledge and uh, this is true you know you ask anybody who's ever done this with a magpie they're gonna tell you <laughs> if they released it or not they learned a lot from that bird if they're successful in raising it and um, so that's what we were doing with Derek we ended up keeping him because we realized that instead of releasing him because we realized that the context now uh, is such that by imprinting him with people as we had uh, we pretty much made it impossible for him to survive you know easily out out in the so-called wild of our neighborhoods, so to speak, right? Like he might end up landing on somebody's shoulder that's gonna freak out and kill him. Or, you know, he doesn't have enough fear of dogs and cats or automobiles, you know, lots of dangers that he doesn't know about because he was raised by us um, that pro kind of prohibited us letting him go. But through him, we had some really awesome relationships with wild magpies too where we did get get the same kind of learning um that those that the stories that old ethnographer had recorded or had talked about so um once we had derek and we kind of let that be known people started contacting us with injured birds <laughs> and saying could you help him and so we got into the injured bird uh, rescue volunteer business um, just on a kind of a fluke because people associated us with a wild bird so I think that covers most of my bases now on that on the history and I didn't know what would all come out telling it I think this is kind of the first time I've tried to lay it all out, but it, if I really laid it out, all out and did it carefully, I think it would make a real interesting story. Um, so thanks for asking the question. I think it came from uh, Steve. Thanks for ask, asking the question and giving me, giving me an opportunity, a first opportunity to give that laying out of that history a go. Again.